This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 84. I had selected the scripture reading and it made me, it reminded me of uh, Better Is One Day, which that chorus we sang is taken from this psalm and I thought it would be good to sing it and then we could read this and that we would get a better understanding and a desire to follow after the Lord for what we have in the Lord. So Psalm 84. <clears throat> How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow's nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. The Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. As we continue in worship this morning, we do want to take time and just go to the Lord in prayer and call upon his great name. So if you would, bow your heads, your hearts with me, and let's pray together. Lord, like the psalmist, we say, O Lord of hosts, it is better to spend one day, one day, in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. Lord, we know, and we know you are worthy. We sing, Father, to you. We sing these songs. We lift our lives. We worship you because you alone are the living God. There is no other. We praise you for you are our King. You are our God. You are our Lord. You are worthy of all the praise of a lifetime, all that we could muster together, and yet, Lord, it falls so miserably short of how worthy, how holy, how just, Father, you are. We thank you that, Lord, in your attribute of holiness, no one comes before you. This attribute demands justice, and you are just. And you are also the justifier for all those who are in Christ Jesus. So Lord, it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we come before you. We praise you for Calvary. We praise you that our Savior Jesus considered it joy to be obedient to you and to go to the cross. That he would allow his own creation to nail him to that cross. That we might be redeemed. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. In Jesus' blood, he was perfect. He atoned completely, not in part, but in whole. Lord, we have every reason this morning to praise you. Every reason, Lord, to lift our voices in our lives. And for some of us this morning, that might be through tears. But God, you are worthy. We love you. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. And as we come before you, Father, we we humble ourselves, we acknowledge our sin, we, Lord, we take time to repent of it. The sins that have manifested themselves, whether in our thought life or the words that have come out of our mouths or the deeds and actions that we have done, 
Lord, we acknowledge this morning that all our sin is against you and you only have we sinned. So we confess. God, we confess our sins. We confess our hard hearts, our pride. Our, often we want our own way. We do things our own way. We react out of anger and do things, Lord, that are just unbefitting to followers of Christ. And Father, we again are in need of your grace and your mercy. Lord, we confess often maybe uh, ideas in our own mind and things that we have thought have not been in line with your word, but have, have actually had a, a pagan ideas or a pagan worldview that is contrary to the truth that your word conveys. Help us, guide us, Lord. Cleanse us, forgive us. Grow us, I pray. Lord, we plead that you would continue that good work you've begun. I, I pray, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would, as the psalmist, give us that longing to be in your courts. Lord, if one day in, the, in, the, uh, to, in your courts compares to, to nothing that the world can produce, then, Lord, give us that longing to just seek your courts, seek your presence, to walk after you. Lord, lead us by your Spirit to, to just desire to stay at that place. The courts of your house, Lord, lead us away from the wickedness of this world and draw us close. Let us, like the psalmist, have this confession that you are our sun and our shield. You are the one who gives grace and you give glory. So, Lord, we, like the psalmist, say, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you are true to your word, that you change not. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. That comforts our hearts Lord, we thank you that we are blessed. We are blessed to know you, that we have eternity secure in you, that we are the ones who trust in you because, Lord, you have demonstrated yourself to us. You have given us your word. We thank you for your truth. You are God, and we can have that profession this morning. Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your activity. Thank you, Lord, you don't leave us to our own ends. Thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us. Thank you, God, that you have grace for us and mercies that are new today for us. Lord, thank you. And we come, Lord, into your throne room of grace with confidence, with reverence. And we pray, Lord, as your word commands us to pray for all those who rule over us. We pray for our president. We pray for our government, federal and state. Lord, we ask Lord, that you would turn their hearts towards what is right, towards what is just. Lord, we can see upon this world with spiritual eyes, full of the Holy Spirit, the wickedness. So God, we pray despite, Lord, where his position might be, we pray you would direct him towards justice. Lord, we pray over our state in the midst of this recall, Lord, that you would give us a governor who will stand for justice, who will stand for families, a governor who will reject critical theory. Lord, who will stand with, with families and teachers and, and businesses in our community. Lord, we pray against the tyranny that we are seeing at the federal and state level. God, I, I pray, and that makes me I just think of what is happening in Afghanistan. God, we pray for uh, those who are just uh, crushed, those who have lost their lives, the persecution and the, the persecuted church. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we pray for our missionaries, those who have said, I will go, I will stay those who have Holy Spirit conviction and boldness as you've led them ultimately to a place of, of giving and surrendering their lives for the gospel. So Father, we pray for this situation. We lift it to you. We look to you and no other. We trust in your sovereignty and your power. We trust that even in the midst of this, Lord, you're, you are working your ends, your purposes. We pray for our community, Lord, here. Safety for our first responders. We pray for the medical field, Lord, and our teachers and businesses and those who are forced to do things, uh, Lord, that they, they have conviction against. We pray for your church, Lord, globally. We pray for it here in America that there would be an awakening to the gospel. Lord, you would lead us to stand for truth now. So when persecution comes, it will just be another day we will stand for truth. Lord, I pray for Faith Community Bible Church, the leadership here, that we would have gospel conviction, that we would have a conviction to stand for truth and we would know no other. 
I pray for the ministries here, whether it be men's or women's, students, children, Lord, our small groups, our life groups. God, I ask that you would be at work, that you would utilize these ministries to, to encourage, to strengthen the body of Christ. We pray for the needs of this congregation, whether they be physical Lord, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial. God, we look to you and to you alone. We pray that you would administer to us. You know us better than we know ourselves. So God, we turn to you. We take this time, Lord, to, to call upon your great name. We pray that even in the midst of, of uncertainty and the things that are happening in our world, Lord, that you would give us a heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You would lead us to live that gospel out, to demonstrate it in our actions, in our choices, in our decisions, in our worldview, that others, Lord, who are lost in our community might see, Lord, our good works and glorify you, come to know who you are. So we pray for outreach. Lord, nowhere in your word does it say we are to take a day off or to, to yield in the gospel proclamation. So Lord, lead us that way. Bring us to times of hard work, times of rest, but Lord, ultimately bring us to gospel proclamation, to kingdom growth. Lead us that way. And Father, we also want to take time to pray over the offering this morning, those prepared to give, whether it be online or in the box, God, that our heart would always be towards gospel proclamation, kingdom growth. See lives change. Let it be an act of worship, praising you for your many blessings. Lead us that way, God. And may it be used for that purpose. Lord, we say these words, but Lord, help us to mean it, that all that we are be glorified in us, in your church. We commit it all to you. And we pray this in the wonderful, powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, at this time, it is time to dismiss the children to Children's Church. So if you'd like to step out, and those of us who are Young at heart, but a little bit older. Not much, just a little bit older, right? But young at heart. <clears throat> we will continue to look at what we began last Sunday, which is really a, a continuing of the series, What is God? We finished uh, this series on what is God. I, I took that question, as I've said many times, from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question four, and I, I took the answer, and we just took a Sunday each on one of those attributes of God, and, and um, that is by no means an exhaustive answer to that question, what is God? But I hope through this you'd see the vastness of what Scripture speaks about uh, God as a spirit, how he's infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, and his wisdom, and his power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Um, Charles Hodge has said that was a, one of the, the greatest answers to such a big question. And I love it because it's something that you can memorize. When we sing songs like Blessed Assurance, uh, I pray that you're attaching to this assurance of God who will infinitely, eternally, and unchangeably love me because of Christ. And we can sing, Lord, thank you for assurance that you won't change, Right? How many are thankful that God doesn't have a bad day where he just wakes up a little grumpy and goes, oh, okay, forget it, right? He doesn't have bad days. Um, and I don't know about you, but amen, right? The word thank you. So we wanted to, to look at this, but I didn't want to just leave it. I know every Sunday we come to the Lord's Day and we open up his word and, and we want to hear, we want to be edified. It's one of God's means of grace to us to strengthen us, to encourage us, and, and we do that every Sunday, but I, with following this, that series, I just didn't want to go, well, there you go, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a, a working answer to what Scripture talks about who God is. I really wanted to follow that up and say, you know what, now there is a responsibility upon you. There is a calling upon you. Um, you have been given more understanding, more knowledge about this God who has redeemed your soul. And he has redeemed it not just for the day of salvation, which we say hallelujah, amen, but he has redeemed it eternally. And he doesn't play games, right, in the sense of saying, well, I, no, I, I didn't, you know, I meant it when I sent my son. I meant, Calvary, I meant that you would know him. I meant that you would see uh, who I am through my word. He gives us his word and he expresses and explains to us who he is. So he is calling us. And with that deeper commitment, that understanding to a, to a stronger walk, a more a sure walk with who he is. I'm sure like, like you, you've, you've 
You've been watching the news and the things that are happening in our world, and um, maybe you've, you're just scratching your head like a lot of people and thinking, what is, what is going on? It's easy for us to just you know, come to this place and go, I don't know which, which is the next step. I, I pray, Lord, it's going forward, but I don't know. And in the midst of all the things happening globally and maybe happening in your own life as you're living it out and the struggles that you're faced with, we may have this question because I have been, I've been stressing God is calling us into a deeper walk, a walk with him. Right now, I know that's language we understand. God is spirit, right? He's always with us. But he's calling you into deeper waters. And don't fret over that. He's also Lord of the waters, right? But he's calling you into a stronger commitment. And I've said this is our response to who he is. We're to, to walk after him. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, it's, it's you know, our society, our culture, the things you're looking at, you're maybe scratching your head and going, well, I don't know which way is forward. I was reminded of a, of a story of a missionary one time, E. Stanley Jones, who talked about being lost in the African jungle. He talked about how he was just, seemed like there was just jungle that never ended, and then occasionally there would be a clearing of a little sort, and then there would just be more jungle. And he said, by the providence and, and guidance of God, he came to a hut out in the middle of the jungle, completely lost, and he was uh, able to speak the language and communicate to a native there and, and said, which way is out? I mean, how do I get out of here? I am lost. And the native responded and he said, walk. So they walked. He had his machete and he began to clear a path and this went on for a good hour or so and the missionary, just probably like you or me, you know, you maybe have not would have given it an hour, but after an hour of walking, he was thinking to himself, yeah, he's lost too. So he turns to the native and he says, are you sure you know the way? Are you sure you know where you're going? Do you know where the path is? Well, what a great question, right? I feel like that's us spiritually. The native responded and said, in this place there is no path. I am the path. And I think in life, sometimes when we get to this situation, what's going on in our world, we need to simply rest in the fact that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And you're going to come across moments in your own life where you go, I'm not, I'm not sure the way forward. But we rest with faith and we say, Jesus is the way forward. He is the path. We press harder into the Lord, we follow after him. See, coming to this, what is God, and God calling us to a stronger commitment, we have to be resolved to continue to walk after the Lord. And you and I have lived life long enough that we know sometimes life is difficult. We come across situations where we might scratch our head or we might wonder why. Lord, why? Which way is the path? And we need to be content when Jesus says, I am the path, follow me. To that end, before we go any further into this this message, let us just offer a brief prayer and commit this sermon to the Lord. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity and privilege of prayer, and we ask that as we look to your word, as we review some of the things from last week, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to be with us, teaching us and guiding us. Lord, draw each soul closer to you, and I ask you to get me out of the way. Father, that each of us would receive what you have for us, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I've been stressing and I, through this whole series with what is God, I'm going to stress this point one more time. The things I see happening in our culture and the, and the erosion of the distinction between God as creator, God as unique, you know, the monotheism, we, we worship and serve a God who is living. Uh, he speaks, he creates, right? Creation is not God. And yet in our culture today with uh, the postmodern minds and secular humanism and the rise of, of paganism in our culture, we see that eroding. And unfortunately, you see even confusion out of some of the pulpits in America who don't understand that there is a distinction. We are not to, to be above the Word of God. We are to be under the Word of God and trust that God is creator. This is who he is. And we are the creation. Right? We don't point our finger at God and say, this is what I think your Word says, therefore we are going to do this. See, when that happens, now we are calling the shots 
and no longer the Lord. So I've been stressing this distinction. It's rising all around us. It's in uh, your social media feeds. It's on every television show that you see. It is an indoctrination because that is the paradigm that our world thinks. Our world doesn't think like Christians. Of course not. They're not saved. And so everything they do is edited a certain way to present a, a normalcy that embraces right, pagan ideas. So as Christians, we have to go, well, well, what is God? This is who he is. This is how he created. This is how he tells us he's, this thing's going to end up. This is how he's going to love us uh, forever. And we continue to look at his word. So we are to reflect uh, continually upon who God is. Keep the gospel in front of us, right? I love Jerry Bridges when he says, you should preach the gospel to yourself every morning. I don't know about you, that's great advice. Preach the gospel to you every morning. Today I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Monday morning you should get up and be praying that. But as I mentioned last week, and I do want to take a moment to review, as we, we pursue this walk with God, I, I mentioned, I'm not going to do it this morning, but a lot of verses where the Lord walked with a lot of our Old Testament heroes, right? He called us, and I, the one verse I do want to cite is Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. He poses it as a rhetorical question, responding to all the ways of man. Has he not shown you what he desires of us? Do justly, love mercy, walk with humility right before our God or with our God. And it's amazing that we have this wonderful promise God has, has so loved us and redeemed us and, and desires to that we can walk with him and him with us. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you go, there must be some mistake. I'm not worth the price. I'm not worth it. The God who spoke everything to existence would, would take time to uh, be with me and walk with me. But this is who God is. This is how he expresses himself in scripture. Paul grabs this from from um, Ezekiel, brings it into 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 16. It says, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You now Paul is, is writing to the Corinthian church, and they're looking to idols and saying, let's bow down to idols. And Paul is saying, he's not really saying this, but you're crazy, right? He didn't say that, but no. He says, we don't look to idols. God dwells in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in his church. The building doesn't contain the Lord. The church, the people are, right? The temple of the Holy Spirit. God walks among, among us. So our motivation is to be enamored with this, this thinking, right? Biblically thinking about engaging the God who has redeemed my soul and walking after him. God has desire. He desires this of us. So we're to engage this. We are to preserve or persevere, excuse me, in this walk, after the Lord. Now, I mentioned last week, and I'll mention this again. You know, this is, there's two points that come with this that you have to understand. In Luke uh, chapter 14, Jesus tells us to count the cost, right? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, if you're going to walk after him, if you're going to let go of this world, grab this cross, he says, you better count the cost. See, are you stand against the world, right? That's that's the world says you're, you're taking crazy pills. It's, it's just completely ludicrous to the world to say, why are you doing this? You have to realize that making this commitment and saying, Lord, I now I know a little bit more about who you are, and you're calling my life. You've called my name into deeper waters, into a stronger commitment. You've got to realize that that's going to put you against, just, just by necessity, against maybe those around you, maybe even your own family. They're going to think you're a little bit off. But I also want to encourage you. Um, we shouldn't seek the, the, the applause of the world, right? The endorsement of our culture. We should seek it of our Lord. And that's my second point. It, it, the Lord is immensely pleased. And we say, Father, I don't want the wickedness of this world. Just like our, our scripture reading. Lord, I want to trust in you. I want to follow after you. I want to dwell one day in your courts. I want to count the cost and I want to be with you. In my own devotion time, I've been reading through J.C. Ryle's Holiness. And on this, this chapter he has on counting the cost, there's this great quote. And of course, I, could, I think J.C. Ryle, you should always read J.C. Ryle, it's incredible. 
Listen to this quote, talking about this, this idea of counting the cost and being committed. He says, there are enemies to be overcome, battles to be fought, sacrifices to be made, an Egypt to be forsaken, a wilderness to be passed through, a cross to be carried, a race to be run. Conversion is not putting a man in an armchair and taking him easily to heaven. It is the beginning of a mighty conflict in which it costs much to win the victory. See, you're in this. The Lord has redeemed your soul. You're to stand against the world, so we must be on guard for any worldview or things that might creep into our thinking. So as we look at this, I just want to briefly review what we covered last week. And the two points that I, I wanted to cover last week that I didn't was one is, what is it, how do we go about our, our duty and responsibility to walk? How do we do that? What are some practical ways in which we can walk with the Lord? So I want to briefly review those four, and then we'll look at the blessings and the privileges that come from God's children. Just as there is a, a standing against the world, there are blessings that we can enjoy right now as followers of Jesus Christ. Well, in the review, the first thing I said is to walk with God is to separate from the world. Right? I pointed out that it's, it's um, popular in the modern church, especially in America, to really imbibe the culture, in essence, to win the culture. You know, that's the definition of liberalism is when we take uh, cultural ideas, things that are contrary to Scripture, and kind of package them with, with some Christian language. That's liberalism, right? And, and the heart might be right to say, we want to just want to see people come to believe on Jesus Christ. Well, what, what people actually need to hear is what Jesus himself said, right? So repent of your sins, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, make him Lord of your life. They don't need to hear something more that's, that's like the culture that kind of has a little Christian, you know, uh, bumper sticker on it or something. They need to hear the truth of the Word of God. That is what's best for us. So for us, we need to say, we need to separate from the world, not just uh, become monks or something like that. I'm saying, I'm not going to allow the world to enter into my thinking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my life and say, you know, this is the truth of God's Word. I'm going to model it after His, of His Bible, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to be in the world rather, but I'm not going to be of it. That's what I get. Separate from the world. Draw, draw some hard lines in your thinking. Develop some conviction and say, you know what, if, if, uh, if that's what this says and it's contrary, well, then I'm going to not do that anymore. The second thing is we need to walk with God is to wait on the Lord. And here I'm saying uh, we need to commune with Him. All right, this takes focus and an intentionality. All right, this isn't going to happen if you don't put it on your schedule right? I'd used the expression last week. I, I thought this was kind of funny. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. But it's hard to have a conversation on a long walk with someone if that other person is playing the kazoo, right? And you could substitute any annoying thing, I guess, in that. It's, it's hard to have a conversation with someone if they're right, playing a kazoo, and how often is our prayer time and our commune, our secret place with the Lord, either neglected or distracted because we're the ones coming and playing the kazoo. And it's, it's tough. I'm at that age now where you have your quiet time and I'm in danger of two things. Falling asleep <laughs> and thinking about all the other things I need to do. Reading a book on, from... Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I was encouraged because he himself had struggled with this, finding quiet time with the Lord. I mentioned last week the Puritans struggled with this. They would say, pray until you pray, right? So understand it takes focus and intentionality, but the Lord wants us to commune with him, find that quiet time. Number three, I said we need to, to study. If you're going to walk with the Lord, study his word. Don't just read it. Yes, read it. Memorize it, yes, but give it to study, right? Dig into the, to God's word. It should be a primary necessity for all Christians. You know, we should be understanding one of our hearts and, and goals at Faith Community Bible Church is to have your Bibles open, right? When any, anyone is at this pulpit preaching. So we go, wait a minute, that's not what the word of God is saying. We don't have time for bad theology, so let's get into it and, and dig into it. Let's not be fearful or afraid of theological terms. Just learn them. Take time with it. And I'm just going to just take this pressure off you. You're not going to learn it all. 
Sometimes we think, I need to, I just have to learn it all. It's a thick book. But we, we follow and walk with the Lord one step in front of the other. Just because you don't know something today, we'll just work through that. I've had many times where I've been asked questions and I just, I don't have anything for that. Let me go read and study. I've been at times where even theology has kept me awake. What does this passage mean? It's not uncommon. But because those things happen, don't yield. Continue to dig. Have that resolve. As I mentioned last week, you know, this is important and vital for the church. The church has lost sight of the holiness of God. Therefore, we've kind of lost sight of calling people to repentance. We've lost sight of our sin, and we've de-edified God. We've edified man. And so the, the, what's, what's preached or presented from many pulpits is, is not really the gospel. It's, it's kind of this easy believism, just kind of come and, and continue to, to be who you are in your life, and there's no real life change. But yeah, now you can, you can trust that you're saved. I'm, I'm fearful for any person in that boat because they might hear the words of our Lord and Savior on the day of judgment that says, depart from me, I never knew you. See, what we save people with is what we save them to. Why the gospel must be clearly articulated? Because there is an atoning sacrifice that has to take our place. And what a believer is going to follow, right? A believer is going to have conviction about sin. They're going to begin to mourn over their sin. They're going to begin to follow and love the Lord's church. They're going to be in his church. They're going to read the words of Jesus and hear his commands, and they're going to be a joy. Over and over and over again, we see in Scripture this delight, a delight in the word of God. Those things should be growing in us. Be sure of your salvation. Study the scriptures. The last thing is, what comes of this is, is to simply trust the Lord. Right? There are times, as I mentioned earlier, we just say, Lord, I don't know. I am, in the, I am the thick of this jungle. Where is the path? Well, I trust the Lord. I trust right, my Savior, Jesus. He will lead me through this valley. He will lead me over the mountaintops. He will lead me through the difficulties. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 13. I say that about every psalm, so just take that for what it is. But my favorite psalm, Psalm 84, I could have said that this morning as well. But Psalm 13, David in six verses goes from, where are you, God? Scratching his head, where are you? Pouring his heart out. Within six verses, he is saying, I will trust you. You have been good to me. You have dealt bountifully with me. I will sing and I will worship you forever. That's, that's. See, David knew where to go. Bring it to the Lord. I trust you. You've been good. You will be good again. That's a walk we need to emulate. So that is the review. That's what we covered. Right? That may sound like a lot. You may say, Pastor, you're asking a lot, but I'm not really asking anything that Scripture isn't asking of each of us. This is what his word says, and we could actually expand what it means to walk, but these are four practical ways to say, here's, here's what it means to start walking, right? Walk different. Walk with this God that, that you know now is, is infinitely holy, and he's eternally just, and he's unchangeable in his goodness. That's who he is. He's worth the walk. So now we come to the second point of uh, this duty, this responsibility to walk after the Lord, and it's the blessing and privileges, right, of God's people. And, and I'm just going to go through these. The first one I, I put in here is uh, that soul, right, that is walking with the Lord is what I mean by that. That soul will, who is walking with God will be conscious of the righteous, conscience, excuse me, cautious, conscience, there it is, of the righteousness of God. Right Through the whole series of what is God, we've talked about this attribute that God is pure and he is, he is light. There's no darkness in him at all. He is extraordinarily holy and, and uh, he, he lives in immense glory. Right, This is who he is. But every sinner who repents of their sins and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ understands that God's righteousness, although it will bring judgment, we are redeemed. And we walk with the Lord and we understand the gospel. We understand that, that, that the Lord has provided for us an atoning sacrifice. Jesus said, I will take their sins upon me. It's the great exchange. I give to Jesus all my sin and all my garbage and all my brokenness and all my cares and all my concerns. And, and he gives to me the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. He doesn't make me righteous. He gives me the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. He gives it to everyone who will believe and repent of their sins and believe on Jesus. 
Now I can take time and be conscious of, of God's righteousness and realize when that day comes, I have a full pardon in Jesus. I will not stand on my own accord. I will not say, hey, you know what, I, I think I can be good enough. I will say, there's no way. But I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. See, I know, I and mean, hopefully you know now, that all those who've repented and believed on Christ know that they will be saved eternally and infinitely and unchangeably so he's going to love you this way. So we are blessed to go, although we know the Lord is righteous and, and one day our enemies will be judged, I know I am redeemed. I can give thought to that. It lifts my voice in worship. The second thing is that soul walks with God will behold God's goodness and his sufficiency. We will taste and know the power of God and the goodness of God. We won't be satisfied with the world. We won't look to ourselves. We'll begin to look upon our situation and our circumstances differently. See, the world and all, what it produces as goodness, it will lose its appeal. It will fade. We know God's goodness is eternal. Last week, our scripture reading was Psalm 73, and, and I have this in my notes, and um, and we can confess this, just like Asaph, who says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Forever. So we walk with God, we begin to look upon our lives differently. No longer do we look at our neighbors and go, Man, I wish I could keep up with the Joneses. I wish I had some of those worldly things. You won't be content with that. That will vanish. As we walk with God, we'll start to be content with what the Lord has blessed me with. I know I, I joke about this often, and you may laugh at me, but I am always thankful to the Lord. It brings thanksgiving on my lips every time I hold a cup of coffee. When my wife and I, when we were newlyweds and we were in the ministry, we didn't have a lot of funds, but I, I kind of said, uh, you know, sweetheart, when we're in the ministry, can we at least agree to always have a good, a decent cup of coffee? Is it, is, can it just be worthwhile we spend a couple extra dollars on a good cup of coffee? And that was a lot. Sometimes that, that couldn't happen. But we tried. I look back on 20 years of ministry and the things, the highs, the lows, and all the things that we've been through. The Lord has been good. I have had many good cups of coffee. I see his goodness. Yeah, do I have everything my neighbors? No, nor do I want them. I see what the Lord has blessed me. I walk with him and I see his goodness. Number three, well, that soul that walks with God will be illuminated by the love of God. This is reciprocal, isn't it? First John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. When we come to Calvary and we stand at Calvary and we just simply stand there and maybe we're in silence or we're weeping at this amazing love that he has for us there is something that, that uh, wells up in us that we desire my family to know this Savior, uh, you know, those coworkers, those friends, to know who this Savior is. There's a reciprocal love. Don't we see that in our lives as we walk after the Lord? Isn't there a desire to say, man, I want my family. Lord, I pray for my family. I pray for my loved ones. I'm not going to yield praying for them, Father, until they know you. Give me those opportunities that they might know this love that I have. Bring them to Calvary. Bring them to Jesus. I'm illuminated by his love. I desire others to know his love. When we walk with the Lord, so we're weaned off. The world says love is. We begin to desire his word, his truth. We won't settle for anything else. We'll desire theologically rich songs and not something that is, that is kind of a weaning or, or, or just empty. We want to come to God's house. We want to hear his word. We don't want a counterfeit. I have been to Calvary. Don't give me something that is weak. Give me his word. I've experienced and know his love. Number four, that soul that walks with God will be humbled by the holiness of God. Often in our prayers, I would imagine that you have said, Lord, who am I? I can come before you, the, the angels that you created who are sinless, you created them in such a way that they would have wings that cover their eyes to protect them from your holiness. 
They have other wings that cover their, their feet, and yet they sing nonstop, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Who am I? When I walk with God, we're, we're just enamored with his holiness. And yet he calls us to walk with him. He calls us to be holy as he is holy. It's a humbling thought, isn't it? So that the silversmith who says, or he's asked, when do you know the impurities are out of the silver? And his response is, when I see my reflection in the silver. And the Lord is, is shaping us in the image of his son. What does he want to see in each and every one of us is Jesus. He won't yield till he sees it in us. It's the good work that he says he will be faithful to. We're humbled by his holiness. Number five, that soul walks with God will perceive the sovereignty of God. Begin to look at the world with spiritual eyes. We'll trust and know that, that God is at work, even at, at moments where I feel like I am in a jungle and all I have is this machete and, I, and the guide with me seems like he's lost as, as well. And, and yet I will trust and I will know that even in the midst of this, God is moving. God is not absent. He's true to his word. No matter how it relates to us, to the world, we will submit to his will. Lord, we will trust you. We will desire that our will would, would uh, come under and be in line with his. We walk with God, we will endure the difficulties. Knowing that he's shaping, he's using us to call upon him, he's shaping us into the image of his son. We will begin to want his way, not our own. In Mark chapter 9, verse 7, during Jesus' transfiguration, there is a voice from heaven that comes down and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Get, receive insights. Receive knowledge from him. Follow him. So we will trust even when the jungle is thick and the path doesn't seem clear. My sovereign God is, on, is in control. Number six, that soul that walks with God will contemplate the glory of God. And what I mean by this, it's similar to his righteousness, but I'm looking at the idea of the world, the world that is that is broken. The world is bent on wickedness. The world that, that serves, whether they know it or not, the God of this world, the devil. So we bow in humility before the glory of God. To him alone we give honor and praise. We say, like in Revelation, when John says in 4.11, that he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. So we walk with the Lord, we contemplate his glory. It changes our worship. It changes our heart, our tongue, and it changes our life. And we want to glorify him. We want to follow after him because he's worthy. Number seven, that soul that follows after the Lord or walks after him will view the omnipotence of God. We will see his power demonstrated. We will not rely upon the world or fear the world. We will trust the Almighty God. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. There are countless psalms that speak of, of God being our protection, being our power, being uh, the one who leads the way. We'll trust in his power. When we walk with God, we will see justice come. We'll see the enemies of this world dealt with the righteousness of God. And we as followers of Jesus Christ will rest in safety. It will also motivate us in our evangelism and give us boldness in our proclamation of God. Number eight, that soul that walks with God will contemplate the unsearchable wisdom of God. Again, we're not relying upon the world. The world sees Christianity is foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 25. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign, or excuse me, four signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So we will rest 
and the all-wise government of God. We know at the end of all of this, our God holds our lives in his hands. He doesn't check out. He doesn't go on a coffee break. Even though coffee is good, he doesn't take coffee breaks, right? He doesn't take out or have a, a punch card or something like that. He never does that. And we trust in his activity and, and his wisdom and however it, it unfolds itself in the world, in the church, in the country, in difficult times, hard times. doesn't matter. We will trust and rest in him. This is the blessing, the privilege. We get to look upon the life, uh, this life, this world differently. Number nine, the soul that walks with God will view the infallible truth and unfaithfulness, or excuse me, faithfulness of God. We know this because God keeps his truth forever. It is infinitely true. He keeps his promises. We believe his promises we walk in his promises. And we can have a joyful life in the midst of tears, this side of heaven. So the question that we have to ask ourselves as we look at these blessings and privileges and, and uh, next week as we look about how, how we glorify God, we have to come to this moment and, and think, am I experiencing this now? Am I walking with the, with the Lord? Am I walking with God? Am, am I seeing this? Am I resting in this? Or, or you know, where is the, the problem? You know, it's easy to go through a list like this and say, look, this is the Christian life. You guys need to buck up, and this is, here it is. But we're human. There's times when our faith is strong, and there's times where we go, I don't know the way forward. How did this happen? Lord, here I am. How do we deal honestly with all of this? I think our struggle is often found in looking upon simply our life here and not upon eternal things. There was a pastor one time giving a talk to a group of men and he took out a big sheet of paper and he he took a marker and just made a, a dot in the middle of it. And he held this up to everyone in the room and he says, Men, tell me what you see. And of course, they saw the black dot. We see the black dot. He says, Great, you see the black, outstanding. What else do you see? And after a chorus of, I don't know, right? I don't know. He said, You've completely overlooked the most important thing. You've missed the whole sheet of paper. See, often in life, this is what happens. I'm human. I understand this. We walk through a trial and difficulty, and all we see is that little black dot. Now, in the midst of that, that's probably what, what needs our attention. But I, I challenge you to realize that in the midst of a black dot, you would realize there's a whole sheet of paper. And though we might have pain and sorrow and suffering here, there is an eternity in front of us. And, and this life here doesn't really even compare to eternity. So I don't want to downplay the difficulties, the hardship. The Bible speaks to this. Psalms 30, verse 5, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. We may go through difficult things. The Bible doesn't, doesn't simply say, no, this is the easy life. You can have it now. The Bible doesn't say that. Jesus tells his disciples, you're going to have hardship. You're going to have difficulty because of me. And I've said at the beginning of this sermon, prepare yourself as you get closer to God and, and make a stand for the Lord and live for him. Those around you who know you're going to think you're crazy. You're not guaranteed the easy life. Can there be sorrow in our lives as Christians? Yes. There can be sorrow. There can be moments where I go, I don't know the way forward. Lord, I don't even know this machete you've given me, how to even use it. I, don't, I, I want to quit. In the middle of our jungle, we may say, I just want to sit down here. The Lord who is patient and full of grace, he reminds us, is, 
Is our God not a rock? Is he not a refuge? Is he not a real help in times of difficulty? Can we not get to a place in our own walk like Paul who says, I am persuaded. Paul, and to the end of his life, I am persuaded. I know in whom I have believed. See, there are plenty of opportunities, plenty of black dots that we can focus on. And sometimes that's just where we're at. We need to see that there's so much more. God has this, a huge sheet of paper and says, look at all this. To getting closer to the Lord, this is where trust comes from. This is where studying his word benefits us. This is where our, our quiet time and our communion with him grows us and comforts us. This is why it leads, our duty to walk with him leads to seeing these blessings and these privileges because we begin to look at life and saying, yeah, I might be going through this hardship. And though there might be sorrow right now, I know there is a day where joy is coming. I know there is a day where the Savior himself will look in my eyes and wipe my tears away. I know there is a Savior who right now, despite knowing the eternity that is ahead of me, that right now says, you know what, Tyson, I know you're lost, but I will stand with you in the midst of this jungle, and I will show you the way. I have a Savior who is patient. I have a Savior that says, you know what, come this way. I know it, Tyson, I know, just come this way. No, no, come this way. I have a Savior who doesn't give in and give up. I have a God who's, who's a real help. It's not something the world can ever give you. This is why there are times for believers when we go through that dot, we go through that jungle, where you see those who have walked with the Lord who says, I know, I know a day is coming, I know. I know I'm who I have believed, like David who says, I will worship the Lord. The situation doesn't change, but I will worship him because he has been good. He will be good because this is who he is. We're not guaranteed the easy sight, the easy road. Sometimes that road is, is hard and it's not straight and sometimes it's uphill both ways in the snow, right? It's that kind of road. The Lord will lead us through it. These are the privileges, the blessings. This is what happens when we, we dig harder into God and we understand who he is. The moments of life where there's no path, I know my Savior is the path. Now to us this morning, and just a, a note of closing, all these blessings and privileges that we have are for those and only those who have placed their hope and their life in Jesus Christ. It's only for those who have said, you are the Lord of my life. I've repented of my sins. I've humbled myself. I've believed on the Lord Jesus for salvation. These are the blessings for followers of Christ. See, in this life right now, right, available to every single one of us is Jesus. And those who believed on Jesus have these, can begin to look at the world, have these blessings, these privileges. But those who have not, I, I impress upon you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. See, for the unrepentant, those who say, you know what? I know right now I, I, I can either, I'm guaranteed a fair trial before the Lord or a full pardon in Jesus Christ. I, I realize that's ahead of me. Those are my, my options in front of me, but I think I'm going to take my chances my own way. I think I'm going to go the fair trial route. Well, no one stands worthy. We can't, there's no works on this planet to undo the sin that we have already committed. And I just simply want to read a couple of verses from Revelation so you know what's ahead of you. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. John the Apostle recording this, he says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. 
and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, all of us would say, yeah, the devil deserves. But as you drop down in Revelation chapter 20 to verse 15, it says this. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, this means those who haven't believed on Jesus Christ, the Savior. He says he was thrown into the lake of fire. If you've been with us through this series, you know God is just. And he is holy. God must, to be holy, he must punish sin. And you will either on that day bear that in your own life, or you will today repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, who alone has paid for our sins. And then, right, then we enjoy the blessings that come with this. We, like the apostles, get to follow him, suffer for his name. So I just impress upon you that the Lord isn't looking for your sincerity. He isn't looking for a simple prayer. He's not looking for, hey, this, is this prayer enough? Let me pray this simple prayer and just go about my, my day. I, I'm good. It's not what the Bible talks about. The Lord is looking for your life. That you will humble yourself. Repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. He knows the way forward. He is the way, the truth, the life. It's amazing to me that in all the areas of our lives, we don't do this with doctors. We don't, we don't say, well, I'm sick, I feel bad, and I'm going to run to the doctor, and, and we get there and the doctor's not there. Well, you say, well, I'm just going to keep on running. My sincerity is just, it'll work itself out. Everyone will know I'm sincere, so eventually I'll get the help. I'm sincere. We don't do that anywhere in our lives. Sometimes we come to the gospel and we say, well, as long as I'm sincere, no, he wants your life. The language of the Bible is he is master. We are slave, servant. We have been bought at a price. We have been redeemed. We have been purchased. And we get to follow him. The son who he sets free is free. We're free to follow. That's the joy of the gospel. If you're here this morning, I want to impress upon you that today must be a day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Simply through prayer, humble yourself. Confess your sins. Believe on Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time you've given to us. This time that we can open your word. And Though we've cited many scriptures, I pray that Lord, the Holy Spirit would just bring it to life in us. Lord, we thank you that, that we have looked into your word and are learning more about who you are. We also see the responsibility that is upon each and every one of us. Just walk with you. What that means, what that looks like, and the changes that are necessary. I thank you, Lord, for the, for the many privileges and blessings that come to us being able to think about and contemplate, Lord, how you infinitely love us, eternally love us, unchangeably will love us. You will always love the Son. You will love all those who the Son has redeemed. Lord, you are good. Thank you for these privileges, the privilege and honor of following you. So God, I... I just say thank you for every, every soul here that knows you as Lord and Savior. And I also want to pray, Lord, that you would stir those this morning who may not know you. That today would be a day of salvation. You bring them to that place that your spirit would just bring your word alive in us. Bring those verses of revelation alive in us. That today, Lord, we would... We would cast our life upon Christ and receive the full pardon that Christ alone and him alone can give. Lead us that way, I pray. 
And Father, we just simply thank you. We praise you. And I, I, I know many of us this morning going through what's happening in our world, the uncertainties, Lord, remind us often and always, Jesus is the way forward. When we know nothing else to do, let us stand firmly with complete conviction. Jesus is the way forward. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray this all in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are here this morning and um, questions about what it means to believe on Christ, I'll be up here following the service uh, to answer any questions that you might have. I would love to, to help you with that. Or, or if you're in need of prayer, uh, of anything like that, that um, again, I would love to do that for you. I'll be up here available to you. We're going to close by singing uh, the hymn 365. It's hymns 365, but it's close to thee. And um, it's a Fanny Crosby hymn. It's a hymn that I wasn't really super familiar with, but it's a great hymn with great words. Uh, also, so I'll, what I'm going to do here is I'd like to, to invite you to stand and to, um, we'll close with this as our doxology, but then I'd ask you to, to following this hymn, if you would set down and uh, that sounds kind of rude, but I'd like to do the right hand of fellowship with a few that are here to become members of Faith Community Bible Church. So uh, if you would, let's stand together and we'll bring our service to a close with this and then we'll ha enjoy the right hand of fellowship. stands one more time.
go ahead and please be seated just briefly. And it's my pleasure to, to bring three who uh, desire to become part of Faith Community Bible Church. So if Robert and Jackie Mendez would come up here and uh, James Allen would get on up here as well. They expressed to me how they don't like to be in front of people. So if you would, please direct all your attention and look. No. <laughs> Just try to soften it a little bit. You know, one of the things that we do in membership... Um, we always want to just, you know, as we go through the class, we talk about what it means to be a part of, of the Lord's Church, what it means to be a part of Faith Community Bible Church. And part of that process is, is to go through the class and fill out your, uh, the paperwork that goes with that. And I submit it to the elders, and the elders uh, take time and give me the, the thumbs up or the thumbs. No, they don't do that. But uh, we pray over the, all the applicants that come, and it's a serious thing. And I, and I want to just take a moment to say, you know, it's important to be part of the Lord's Church, to be committed to it. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just simply ask them a few questions, <clears throat> have them respond, and then I have a question for each of you because, uh, you know, the church is a family, and we want to see, you know, godly members be a part of it, and there's accountability that happens, right, whether you like it or not, right, we're accountable to each other. Uh, so I want to ask them a few questions, and I want to ask you a question, and then we'll have the, the time of right hand of fellowship. So this is Robert and Jackie Mendez, and that is uh, James Allen at the end. So here's my first question. Do you agree that your salvation is due to God's uh, love and his activity of Christ upon the cross alone uh, for, the, for salvation and not the things that you did to please him? Answer yes or no. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's the right answer. Right? <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating for them a little bit, huh? Uh, my next question is, do you believe that Jesus is God and that he died for your sins? Yes. yes. Uh, do you promise to show your love for Jesus uh, by trying to obey him and to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and to help you? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> next question is, do you promise to use your talents and gifts uh, to help grow and serve this body of believers uh, and to move forward in, in the call to see non-believing people become committed followers of Jesus Christ. Yes. One more question. Uh, do you agree to support and pray for the leadership of Faith Community Bible Church and to come under the authority of the pastor and the board of elders, our eldership, uh, when you endeavor to advance in, and, and, excuse me, and to endeavor and to advance into holiness and the unity that we experience here as a church? Okay, one question for you all, because here's the accountability. Faith Community Bible Church, you out there, uh, do you promise to love and support and encourage uh, these new members, Robert, Jackie, and James, as new members in the fellowship here at Faith Community Bible Church, to be accountability and receive accountability from them? If so, would you please answer yes? Yes. Or amen. That'll take that too, Dr. Bob. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to welcome officially to our fellowship, uh, let's, yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me pray, you guys, you can't sit down, right? Uh, let me pray just a simple benediction prayer, and then I invite you to come up here, welcome them, and hug on them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you, Lord, that you've, you're growing in us a desire to follow after you, to be close to you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the time we've, we have uh, experienced this morning and that we have had. Um, in your church together. We thank you for the new members coming who said, this is, this is our community, this is our fellowship. Lord, I thank you for that. It is your activity, your Holy Spirit at work. So we pray your blessings upon our new members and upon those this morning. And uh, Lord, we give you all the praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed, but on the way of being uh, heading out that door, come this way and welcome.